Let's talk about skill in combat, how important it is to weapon use, and what difference it actually makes to commanders and battles and big scale strategy. Hi folks, Matt Easton here, Scholar Gladiatoria. So fundamentally, this seems like a simple topic. Is skill important in war? Now clearly skill is important in duels, but is it really that important in war? There are many other things, many other considerations in war. Numbers of troops, how well the troops are fed, how healthy they are, um, what kind of equipment they've got, this kind of stuff. But skill clearly is one of those things, and clearly modern militaries and historical militaries devoted a lot of attention to um, improving the skills of their troops. And sometimes the skill of the troops made an important difference to the outcome of the battle or the war in some cases. I should just mention before I go on that this video appropriately is sponsored by Skillshare, but I'm going to have a bit more information for you about that and a special offer a little bit further on in the video. So fundamentally, is skill important? in war? Is it important in battles, in large-scale bodies of troops? Well, obviously the answer is yes, but more we can unpack that into how important is it? Could we say that um, skill is a relatively small importance compared to number of troops or um, how well the troops are armoured or armed? Well, that's up for debate, isn't it? There are some very conspicuous examples from history. I'm sure you know of some uh, yourself. Um, the 300 Spartans being the first example that leaps into my mind, but there's lots of examples from history where highly motivated, highly um, trained and maybe well-equipped troops, but particularly their training and motivation and morale means that they are able to defeat a larger body of enemy. Even as, well, even in recent wars we see this in, I won't mention necessarily very recent uh, wars, but I'm sure you can think of examples there. But even if we come to the Second World War, there are examples in the Second World War of special forces um, British, American, Italian that I can think of, paratroopers, commandos, people like this, who were able to really rout and in some cases capture a large number of the enemy purely because of their superior training and therefore skill. So I think that we can say when it comes to special forces or elites, skill is very, very important. But how important is skill in an average body of troops, in the normal regular rank and file of troops? And how does that impact the type of equipment they're given? Well, as this is a weapons-based channel, we're now going to look particularly at um, how it dictates what type of arms and armour you equip the troops with and how important their training with those weapons or equipment is in the outcome to campaigns, battles, skirmishes and wars. Now if you want to work on your skills I have got a fantastic offer for you here from Skillshare. Skillshare is an online learning community with thousands of inspiring classes for anyone who loves learning and anyone who loves creativity and wants to learn some new skills. Why don't you invest in yourself and your personal growth? If you've got a specific skill you want to learn then Skillshare is the place for you. From photography and illustration to graphic design, freelancing and more, you can find classes that will match your goals and interests. Whether you're an antique sword dealer like me, or if also like me you run a martial arts club that you want to document better and help promote, or maybe you're a budding fantasy artist or you run role playing games, you're absolutely going to find something for you on Skillshare. So I've recently been watching a fantastic course, it's called DIY Product Photography, Style and Shoot Creative Skills, and it's run by Rachel Gilotta and Daniel Inskeep who are husband and wife team. So I wanted to join Skillshare to see if there was anything on there that I'm currently doing that I could do better. And you know what, there's a ton. I was immediately drawn to this course because of course I do a lot of product photography myself. So the course was absolutely great just for a little bit of fun. I took these photographs here, which show, you know, something I suppose that I've thought about composition of photos and telling a story. And usually I just post pretty pr dry photos of antique swords, but trying to tell a story through the photo. So I've got a great offer for my viewers right now for the first thousand of you, okay? So for the first thousand of you, by clicking on the link below down to Skillshare, you can join for a month for free. You can get access to Skillshare for free for a month. You can check it out. It's absolutely awesome. I'm sure you're going to love it. Now let's get back to talking about skills in warfare.
Let's have a little look at the types of weapon choices that might be dictated by skill uh, and training. Well, first of all, we have to look at where are the troops being drawn from. And at different points, different uh, soldiers were drawn from different um, parts of society, even different geographies. So, uh, for example, um, in the Roman period, it was um, very much preferred to take troops, if possible, from rural areas, because these were regarded as people who would make better soldiers than than townsfolk. For kind of obvious reasons that you can think of, they're more used to, used to um, living with the land, in some cases living off the land, living in the land. Uh, they're more likely to be um, fit, healthy, strong, um, have good stamina, be able to carry heavy loads, this kind of stuff. So they're more likely to more quickly be able to be assimilated into the Roman military machine. This is true even until uh, modern times where I think there was a preference for rural, um, drawing on rural areas where you could get soldiers who were more likely to be fit and healthy more quickly. Not to say that soldiers weren't drawn from town areas as well, of course they were. Many militias in fact were town based um, and militias were important at various points of history as well. Um, and in some cases city states in Italy for example provided huge armies uh, that fought against each other. So yes troops were drawn from cities as well. But where you draw your troops from is going to play a, play a part in what their natural skills are. For example, archers. Um, quite simply, you're probably going to find that there is an, on average a slightly higher level of archery skill in uh, rural areas. Not always the case. There were, um, certainly in England, for example, if we take in the late medieval period where um, longbow practice was legally enforced, there were shooting grounds in all towns and cities as well. So people could be just as practiced at archery, perhaps even more so in town areas as they were in rural areas. But looking, generally speaking, across history um, and going back into the ancient period, I think more or less you're going to find people who are more adept with bows, through hunting and general usage in rural areas, and slings uh, and things like that as well. Equally, if we now look to the use of tools that might be compatible with weapon use, so clearly pole arms are quite similar to certain types of tools used by agricultural workers. Uh, for example, pitchforks or flails. These are things which are used in agriculture, which are not dissimilar as objects to things which might you might use in war. And in, for, in fact, a weapon like the bill, for example, comes from the agricultural billhook. So people who live in foresting areas and are used to using billhooks all the time, are going to be more adept at picking up a billhook and using it in war. Their muscles will be more developed to it and their general uh, sort of muscle memory, if you want to use that term, although I don't like it, their kind of, their structure of movement is going to be better suited to it. Equally, people who dig a lot, who plough, um, who um, handle animals, and I'll come on to animals in a second, um, but also the use of axes. Now, this topic was actually inspired by the subject of axes. I've talked a lot about axes in the past, and there is a general opinion that an axe is easier for a person to use than a sword. Is it? I have always argued no, um, more or less. And that's the, re the reason for that is because in combat, there are many, many things that dictate combat. Timing, distance, um, being able to perceive what the opponent's likely to do next. Uh, and both offense and defense. Now, um, axes aren't fantastic in defense, but they are very good in offense. I have always argued that in a one-on-one -on -one duel, a person with an axe has a disadvantage against a person with a sword if they're of roughly equal reach. If you make the axe into a long Danax, then the Danax has the advantage. But if they're of roughly equal reach, then the sword has the advantage over the axe for various reasons. But people have come back at me and said, oh, but Matt, the axe needs less training. Well, overall, I don't think that's true. I think it's easier to defend yourself with a sword for numerous reasons that I won't go into at the moment because I've covered that in previous videos and I'll probably mention it in future videos. But in offense, I kind of maybe agree in that a relatively untrained person is going to pick up an object in a hammer fist and they're likely to just swing as hard as they can with it at the opponent. And in that case, they are more likely to put down an opponent quicker with an axe than they would do with a sword, possibly. 
but it's marginal. It's not a definite, it's not a clear-cut thing, but I can kind of see that side of the argument. So are there certain weapons which are easier to use and quicker to train people in? Absolutely yes. What are the weapons which are pretty damned quick and easy to train people to use? Well, surprise, surprise, if we look at history, we see some of the answers. First of all, we'll mention the spear. The spear, because it's one of the earliest weapons developed and has been on, in every part of the world and has been probably the most widespread uh, weapon used in war um, since humans existed. Um, so absolutely, the spear or javelin, because obviously you can throw a spear in most cases, and if it's not too big or too heavy. Um, and the spear is relatively easy to use. You don't have an awful lot of options uh, in terms of um, to decide what to do with it or therefore what, what to defend against against it either. It is basically a thrusting weapon. Yes, there are some types of spears which can cut, but overall most spears are primarily thrusting weapons with a long shaft, with a long handle essentially. So from that point of view, they're relatively simple in use. They've got less options to them, less complications to them than something like a halberd or something like a sword. Now, Bows have been hugely used throughout history, but I would not argue that to be efficient with a bow in war um, is particularly easy in comparison to other things. OK, I'll, I'll expand on that now. So overall, yes, bows have been around since prehistory and have been used by anthropologically used by just about Every cultural group, not literally everyone invented bows, but almost everybody invented bows and used them in warfare from a tribal level upwards to high civilization. So absolutely bows are ubiquitous and omnipresent in history, but they're not particularly easy to use. So when you look at a spear, how quickly can you teach someone to be effective in war with a spear? Probably in a day. How quickly can you teach someone to be effective in war with a bow? I would argue... You could teach them to use a bow in a day, but are they going to be effective in war in a day? I'd say probably not. Partly because they need to be able to use a bow, draw a bow and shoot a bow of a relatively decent draw weight. Otherwise, it's not going to reach enemies very far away. Is that important? Well, possibly in tribal conflict, it's not. Maybe the engagement distances will only be 20 or 30 yards with bows, in which case basically a child with a bow could be effective in war. So I think this one's open to question. But in terms of more coordinated and larger scale battles and wars and military campaigns, when you're coming up against other trained enemies, you kind of need a certain level of quite high level of archery to be effective against other people who are likely to have trained with their bows. And in that scenario, you could argue there are other missile weapons which are easier to train people with and require less skill. What are those? Guns, okay? Guns are the obvious example. A musket. You can teach someone to load and fire a musket adequately well, easily in a day, probably in a couple of hours, okay? So you can literally, so long as you have a culture that can manufacture some form of firearm, you can equip people with it and make them militarily effective with it really quite quickly, okay? Also, if we go back into the Middle Ages, crossbows. I would argue that crossbows, and this is probably why they were given to uh, militias and town guards, people like this, um, and um, uh, garrisons of castles and things like this, partly also because those crossbows are in some ways easier to use from walls and out of windows and stuff like that than longbows are, for example. So I would argue that crossbows require less training to be militarily proficient with or efficient with. So a bunch of people who've been trained in a day to use crossbows, how to load them, how to shoot them relatively accurately and obviously reload and solve basic problems with them. You can train them in a day and they are pretty much an effective fighting force that you can defend a position with. With longbows, more difficult I think because yes with light powered longbows they could be efficient but to get them up to the power of longbows where they could oppose and be accurate enough to oppose the crossbowmen that you've trained in a day I think it would take a lot longer with the longbowmen. So, bows, absolutely omnipresent throughout history, but I think there are other missile weapons that are obviously higher technology. Crossbow is one step up in terms of technology and manufacturing than a, than a bow, 
and firearms are quite a long way up because you've got to be able to manufacture gunpowder um, but and barrels that won't explode when you put gunpowder in them but uh, clearly uh, what I think anyway I would argue those weapons are quicker and easier to train people to be military effective with than a bow. Now in terms of sidearms so we're talking about things like swords, knives, daggers, maces, axes, war hammers flails, things like this. Um, are some of them easier to use than others? I would say very generally speaking, shorter bladed weapons are probably require less skill because most people are more familiar with them, more people are familiar with tools and kitchen knives and things like this. Um, so generally speaking, anybody can pick up a knife and be relatively dangerous with it pretty damn quickly because they know what to do with it. Swords perhaps require a little bit more training, but I would not say very much more. I'd say you could give a decent sword to most people and even if they just hit the opponent with it, um, then depending on what type of sword it is. Now this is an interesting thing. So rapiers, for example, or narrow bladed swords, um, thrusting swords, I think probably require a little bit more training to make people really effective with them than necessarily something more like a, um, a broad bladed arming sword or a falchion or a gladius or something like this. Um, so there is perhaps some variation, but in the grand scheme of things, I don't think it's a colossal amount of variation. It basically for me comes down to length and how wieldability is, and longer swords tend to be less wieldable for typical people, fresh recruits. Um, longer blades, I think, require a little bit more getting used to, and equally, thrusting requires a bit more practice I think than or being effective with it than cutting does because most people's natural inclination is to hit and for the same reason therefore I would say things like maces, axes, war hammers, clubs they are easier for most people to be militarily effective with because they are top heavy weapons they have more effect when you hit with them if you just do a simple hit and therefore lots of people can just pick them up and hit with them and be effective. Now if we just jump for a second into the modern world bayonets I would argue are pretty damned easy to be effective with they're essentially a spear although they're obviously heavier and shorter than a spear because they're attached to a firearm but um, when you're if you've got a single shot musket for example or you've got a even in the World War I context, you've got a, a magazine bolt action rifle, but it might only have five round capacity or 10 round capacity. And if you've jumped into a trench and you've shot your five rounds or your 10 rounds, you might not have time to reload. Um, so you have to use the bayonet. So I think the bayonet's a relatively simple thing to use, but this is when we come into is skill useful for raw recruits? Well, clearly the answer is yes. And clearly a basic level of training for your troops is uh, is useful. There are, there are no real negatives to training your troops how to be more effective with their weapons and preferably more effective than the enemy are. So the Romans spent, they were very professional, well they were completely professional troops, most of them anyway, and they uh, devoted a lot of time to training their men to use their weapons. They got them better at throwing their pilums, they got them better at handling their shields, they got them better at using their swords, um, and so they had a methodology for training. And if we look at modern militaries, this is usually the case. However, we do find that there is a trade-off. So for example, in the modern world, many militaries still have bayonets, but many modern militaries have now basically stopped doing bayonet training. Or at most, all they do is they just get the people to fix bayonets, charge at a position and stab a sandbag lots of times while screaming. Now if we rewind to World War I, if we go back to World War I, we see that they were doing all of that and they had a high level of bayonet training because they were actually teaching people how to basically fence with their bayonets. They were teaching them how to parry another bayonet thrust. They were teaching them how to oppose swords, how to oppose cavalry. Um, you know, how to use the butt of the rifle, um, all sorts of different, slightly more complex techniques. It wasn't super, super uh, complex stuff, but it was essentially fencing. And not only that, not only did they train them the theory, but they actually fenced with them. They had fencing muskets as they were known. Uh, so they had trainers with plunger bayonets on the end and they wore big heavy versions of fencing masks and padded jackets uh, and groin protection. And they actually fenced, they actually fought. And not only did they fight against other people with bayonets, they fought in groups, they fought against people with swords, they fought against people on horseback with lances and swords. Um, so they really trained it. Uh, these days people don't because it's now seen as not a worthwhile 
um, use of time because there are other things you could be doing with that time. Okay. Now, I would argue that bayonet training should be something that which is still a little bit more time is spent on because it not only does it teach you how to use a weapon that you're issued more effectively but in addition to that it teaches you other things as well it teaches you aggression it teaches you how to physically you know be a physical person and get in and rough and tumble and take a position at point blank range at, at knife range basically and it still happens in the modern world i have got friends who are in the military and or have been in the military who have used bayonets. Um, it happens. It doesn't get spoken about a lot in newspapers. And um, one of the most common um, ways that bayonets are used in the modern world is for crowd control, uh, I'm afraid. Um, so in, a, in, a, in an environment where you are not supposed to be shooting people um, because they're not enemies, um, but they are nevertheless causing a problem, fixing bayonets can can help uh, defend, defend troops. Equally, we all know that there has been lots of knife fighting uh, militarily, not just in the civilian world, but there's been lots of knife fighting uh, in uh, Afghanistan, for example, in the taking of the cave systems. So it happens, uh, even in the modern world. And um, certainly in law enforcement, it happens a lot as well, where, um, where people will attack with knives rather than firearms because they don't have a firearm or whatever. So um, it absolutely happens. And I, and I think the military still should be doing it more, probably more hand-to-hand -hand training than they do and that should involve their bayonets or knives right but going back to the the ancient and medieval worlds there there was a huge variation in the level of training that was given to uh, soldiers and frankly this is the big kind of like wake-up call i think when you start studying ancient world or medieval history you realize that large militaries for most of history have not given much training to their troops. Now, in some cases, particularly in tribal societies, and you can find this in the Highland clans, for example, or uh, the Gurkhas and various other famous examples, very often the people who were recruited into the military came with a background of combat knowledge. So Gurkhas knew how to use their cookeries already. Uh, sepoys in India knew how to use their tulwars. Um, Chinese troops in some cases knew how to use swords, the Dao. Um, Highlanders knew how to use their broadswords or bayonets. But in many, many cases in France and England and Spain and Italy and Germany and Russia and elsewhere, the basic soldiers didn't know really how to use their weapons until they joined. Now, I said I'd mentioned animals earlier. So cavalry, that's the one thing I haven't mentioned so far. It is really surprising to me to read 19th century accounts of the recruitment of cavalrymen and they were preferred to be drawn from rural areas where they had uh, exposure to horses. However, horses were expensive things and even in rural societies most people didn't own horses and didn't necessarily ride horses and maybe in some cases had never even sat on a horse. They were completely familiar with horses, they mucked them out, they cleaned them, they prepared them for the lord of the manor, but they didn't own or ride a horse themselves. So in many cases in the 19th century, cavalrymen, although they were recruited from rural areas by preference, had not sat on a horse before. They literally hadn't. And so there's accounts of them training the cavalrymen in swordsmanship or lance use and horsemanship. And they usually trained those things separately and they trained them as complete beginners. And they trained them how to use a sword on foot and then they trained them how to ride. And when both of those things were looking like they were coming along well enough, then they put them together and they put them with a sword on their horse. But they weren't, most people weren't raised with the sword in the saddle. Clear exceptions to this in, you know, there were Sikhs uh, who clearly were raised with the sword in the hand and on the saddle. There were obviously Chinese and Mongolians. There were um, the Japanese famously as well. There were the Cossacks. There were, there were these cultures who had that embedded in their culture. But most militaries through, in fact, most of the Middle Ages, probably some of the ancient world and most of the modern industrial world, their raw recruits did not know how to use that stuff. So skills and learning the skills, riding and how to use a weapon was something they learned when they joined the military. So I think we've covered uh, quite a broad range of things in this video and some of those things definitely can be looked at more deeply.
But I think we have to, I mean, I said this right from the beginning. Yes, absolutely. Skills of weapon use um, are vital to soldiers. But when we look at history, we see that very often more attention was given to other things, number of troops, what type of uniform they're wearing, what type of firearm they're carrying, or what type of uh, pikes, what length of pikes they were carrying, things like this, than their actual individual skill. And very often they spent more time marching than they did practicing shooting. And this was a common criticism in the 19th century that troops didn't spend enough time shooting at the range, shooting at anything. And bear in mind that shooting at static targets, that is not even shooting at moving targets. So even in the 19th century, a lot of um, soldiers going around with firearms hadn't actually put many rounds through their firearms. And obviously these days, that is something which is devoted a huge amount of attention to, is getting soldiers to put lots and lots of rounds downrange through their rifles and getting familiar with them but conversely they don't spend much time in close combat hand-to-hand -hand type stuff now if we go back to world war one it was somewhere between the two so world war one soldiers spent a fair amount of time on the range uh, and they spent a fair amount of time training hand-to-hand -hand combat uh, with the bayonet principally um, so we can see a shift there if we go back to the 17th century we see that formation coordination of pike blocks and musketeers seems to have been more important than individual weapon use. So you have to accept that while everybody was wearing swords in the 17th century pretty much, actually a lot of people, and we even find this in reference to dueling accounts, a lot of people who wore swords didn't really know how to use them very well. I mean, they obviously you know how to stab someone and how to hit someone and maybe to do some kind of parrying thing when they try and hit you back. But they were not skilled swordsmen. Don't think they were. Don't think that just because someone lived in an age where lots of people had swords that they were all trained swordsmen. They weren't. We know that from historical accounts. Um, and we know that even people like the Roman army, um, even people like the um, uh, soldiers that were recruited into the armies in the uh, Hundred Years' War and Wars of the Roses and stuff like that, in many cases, they weren't necessarily particularly well trained with their weapons. The exception to that, there are except famous exceptions, is English longbowmen, English and Welsh longbowmen, um, Genoese crossbowmen, people like this. And those people stand out in history as elites because they were so specialised with a certain weapon. The Swiss with the pikes, you could say the Scottish with the Shiltrons, the, um, the, uh, the Southern Welsh and the English with longbows, and so on and so forth. And they really stand out. And that is why they were elites, because they were so skilled with their weapons, but they weren't the norm. They weren't the standard rank and file. I hope this has given you something to think about and a bit of perspective uh, and a bit of context uh, for the ancient and medieval world and the fact that not everyone was a weapon master. The people who were were really elites and really special, just as they are in the modern world. Um, thanks a lot for watching. Uh, check out the special offer for Skillshare. Fantastic learning resource to um, upscale your, your personal skills, uh, like some of the soldiers of history did. Uh, thanks a lot for watching. I hope I'll see you back on the channel really soon. Cheers, folks. Thanks for watching. We've got extra videos on Patreon. Please give our Facebook a like and subscribe if you haven't already. Cheers, folks.